Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld adventure in the Cold Bog with the Cult of Jinx. Last time we left off after beginning the construction of a very large monument to leave a lasting mark in the Cold Bog, we also had to raid a small pirate base and we finally also located the Red Hawk Relic, a powerful plasma sword, so today we are obviously looking to collect it. And with that, today's episode might very well be the second to last in the series. I don't think it's time for the grand finale just yet, but if possible, then we will set everything in motion for that to happen in the next episode. Still, let's take things one step at a time. The dawn of a new morning also means that work on the monument continues. As you can see, granite tiles are currently our bottleneck, but with a few more days of mining, we should hopefully be able to solve that. Also, the sensory mechanites disease is still going strong in some of our colonists. So far though, thanks to the medical care of Leafheart Kevin, it hasn't caused us any problems. Tree speaker Redini, meanwhile, also takes a step towards modernity, as she exchanges her thrombohorn for frag grenades, because the accuracy of those actually does not rely on sight at all, not to mention that this will allow us to keep her a little bit more in the back. Just in that moment, we are then also informed that Chutney's caravan has returned, with Chutney slightly malnutritioned. Still, he and Muffalotina have made it back safely, and Super Psycaster Light will likely follow suit shortly after. First of all though, Chutney's malnourishment causes a mental break. He is now going to dig up a corpse and put it on display for everyone to see. Although not only does he do so pretty far away from the village center, it also stands to reason that the Cult of Jinx is not really going to be faced by this. After all, death has been a faithful companion so far. In the meantime, Light has in fact also returned, and just in time, because for the first time in this series, we are now facing an infestation. Yes, it looks like our bear cave is vulnerable in that regard. So let's make sure we get everyone as far away as possible from that cave, especially our bears themselves. They will now actually all hide in Maniac's and Thoraya's bedroom, while our colonists hunker down at the monument construction site. That way we are close to our dryads, which would otherwise inevitably draw some attention, and we also have a lovely choke point here that we can hopefully use to our advantage. Just in that moment, a beautiful aurora also lights up the sky and actually reminds me of my holiday in northern Norway. Yes, I did see a few of those myself, although I did not have to fight giant insects in the process. Our colonists, meanwhile, seem to do fairly well for themselves. Frontliner Wyatt here definitely suffers the brunt of the attack. Although, unfortunately, it also seems like the bugs have split up a bit, with some of them attacking our colonists, others demolishing the bear cave, and a third group going after our dryads. And, well, of course, we can't let that happen, especially since we don't have any control over Chutney yet, who seems to be walking right into the danger zone here. And so we sadly have to leave our hideout and kind of shield him from anything worse. Luckily though, we do have plenty of firepower and the occasional psychast in case it's not enough. And so to cut a long story short, we eventually manage to kill the last few bugs, although it does come at a price. Not only do we unfortunately lose Berrymaker Dryad Tom to the insects, no, Chutney himself is also brought to near death thanks to a stray grenade from Redini. Looks like she still needs to practice when and where to throw those. Thankfully though, it looks like he did not take any permanent injuries. And so, as our colonists grab a meal and our bears return to their cave, Leafheart Kevin has a busy evening ahead of him, while the thankfully uninjured Maniac and Donut spent the next few hours destroying insect hives. With the last hive destroyed, the aurora then also ends, as we can see Kevin still busy in the hospital. I had him tend to the more severely injured dryads first, as we were actually on the brink of losing quite a few of them. And you can also see it here, Thoraya and Freya are still tending to some of the more severely injured ones, and things actually don't stop there. To make matters even worse, a lightning strikes right next to one of our Garenland trees, and actually also hits one of our dryads inside of its healing pot. So let's quickly make sure that it doesn't burn to death and that the fire doesn't spread, and with that, the next morning is already here. Thankfully, a fairly calm day lies ahead of us, and on the bright side, all of those insect corpses are providing us with an excellent meat source for kibble, which is actually needed in greater quantities once more, as with the temperatures rising, most of the corpses inside of our bear caves will start to rot soon. Coco then also brings in the first Devil Strand harvest of the year. This should be enough material for at least two Devil Strand capes, although admittedly, with the increase in power armor availability, I am not entirely sure if those are actually still needed. 
In the evening then it's time for another stakeholding animal sacrifice. Yes, we are slaughtering our oldest yak grit here, partly because I think we really don't need it that much anymore, but also, more importantly, to recharge our Psycaster Psyfocus, which partially because of the recent quests as well as because of the insect infestation has certainly dropped a bit. And so, as Redini teaches about the meaning of life and death and a few other things, Grit is slaughtered, the satisfying completion of the ritual earns us another ideology development point, our Psycaster Psy focus is recharged, everyone participating also gains a plus 5 mood bonus, and on top of it all, Redini also receives a completely worthless shooting inspiration. And with that, the day comes to a close as we receive another quest. A group of six refugees are asking us to take them in. They could potentially be friendly and perhaps even join us permanently. However, they could also have more sinister intentions. Now, at this point in the series, I'm actually not quite sure if this is something we want to bother ourselves with. But let me know what you think. I'll make sure to end the episode before the quest expires. Around midnight then, as a rainy thunderstorm sets in, Wyatt experiences a go frenzy. And who knows, maybe that comes in handy. There is one more quest we definitely want to complete today. In the meantime though, the next morning arrives and with it clear signs that spring, or even summer, is finally here. No more frosty snow on the ground and corpses are starting to rot left and right. Thankfully, we can simply dump them in the river where they don't get in the way. Our anima tree is then also once again ready for the next linking ritual, and that means Wyatt is about to receive his fifth rank as Psycaster and the ability to go with it. While that is going on, we can also see that the thunderstorm has unfortunately set fire to some of the wooden pillars inside of our monument, so I guess we'll need to reconstruct those, thankfully we have enough wood lying around. Wyatt then receives his fifth Psycast shortly after, and we can make the choice from Berserk, Flashstorm and Psychic Pellets, and since Wyatt is a combat-focused character, let's go with those Psychic Pellets from the Combat Psycasts mod. This here is what they look like in action, rapid-fire Psychic Projectiles. I could definitely see some useful applications for that. By the way, we are also informed here that the security threats at the site holding the Redhawk Relic will activate in one hour. If all goes according to plan, those won't be an issue. In the early afternoon then, Thoraya can also bury her berry maker dryad Tom. A new one is already in production, if you will. Nonetheless, this does of course hurt a bit. Our monument, meanwhile, is actually making fairly good progress. Yes, we still need a bunch of granite to finish that flooring, but as you can see, we are getting there, slowly but steadily. And so the evening arrives with Armando finishing an excellent quality Devil Strand cape. We'll see who grabs it, so I'm actually not quite sure who to give it to. And depending on how things progress today, we might just have to overhaul our outfits anyway. For now though, it's time to rest, although in the early morning hours, a pilgrim arrives. Looks like they want to worship the Horn of Edmo. And well, I think we'll let them, mainly also because they don't really offer anything we desperately need, and I think recruitment for this series is in fact done, unless someone truly special comes along. And so, while they worship our first relic, we now assemble a caravan to finally grab our second one, a caravan that includes Super Psycaster Light, alongside Warrior Wyatt, Hunter Donut and Muffalo Maxoplo. And this time we also make sure to give them enough food for both trips, it will take them roughly one and a half days of travel to get to the relic site. In the late afternoon then, they exit the map, and so does our Horn of Etmo worshipper by the way. Without leaving a thank you gift, we'll make sure to remember that. In the evening, things then take a turn for the worse, as a group of pirates attacks in drop pods, and what looks like to be a fairly manageable number here at first, quickly turns out to be so, so much more. Right, so we have here 84 pirates with all sorts of nasty weaponry. I think they are technically split up into three separate groups, so we want to keep that in mind as we engage them. And engaging them in this case means, well, I really think there is only one feasible course of action here. Yes, it's time for Specs to launch another Neuroquake. I have already made sure that all animals and colonists are out of the blast radius. This will, unfortunately, only hit two-thirds of the enemies, but to hit all of them we would need to get much closer, and Neuroquake does have a very risky 12 second casting time. And there we go, with most of the pirates now going berserk and with us receiving the appropriate faction relationship penalties. Thankfully, this still does not make us enemies with the Empire, and we're also still allies with the faction holding the first Arconexus map. At this point, by the way, I think we should keep an eye on colony wealth. 
which currently sits at about 166,000, but I think that number will rise substantially over the next few minutes. For now, things are very much still going as planned. Most of the pirates have already beaten themselves to death, while group number three has not moved anywhere. And so at this point, we are already sporting a colony wealth of a respectable 196,000, a jump of 30,000 silver in just a few moments. That jump can be attributed in part to six triple rocket launchers, a doomsday and plenty of corpses, with a good number of them wearing marine or recon armor. Still, this leaves a group of about 20 pirates still unharmed, and with Light not present, the task of dealing with them falls to Freya. Just as she arrives, the pirates begin their attack, which might actually work in our favor. At the very least, it allows her to safely skip herself closer, find the target with the low shield pack, and drop a berserk pulse on them and their friends. And just like that, she can skip herself back out. As you can see, the rest of our colonists are already waiting. But first, let's see what those pirates are capable of doing amongst themselves. Right, so I think we just saw them waste both a Doomsday as well as a Triple Rocket Launcher, definitely leaving behind a few more dead bodies, and the few enemies left are now heading for our defenses. By the way, this has also just brought us above the cap of 200,000 silver, so at this point in time we could actually already sell our colony and acquire the first Arconexus map. However, like I said at the beginning of the video, we are not going to do that just yet. It definitely means though that the next episode should be the last. Either way, for now we have our enemies coming in, although I don't expect this to be a lengthy fight. And yes indeed, it took exactly two kills and then they decide to flee. So, another crisis averted, time to do some cleanup. We definitely have plenty of loot that we want to grab here. We'll have to see whether or not our colony wealth actually remains above 200,000 for long enough though. If it doesn't, then I guess there's always the next raid. Let's hope that it doesn't have to come to that. From the few people who actually survived this, we are also taking some prisoners, just as a way to perhaps obtain one or two more ideology development points. After all, wrapping up this series with one final ideology evolution seems very fitting indeed. And so it doesn't take long until the first execution ritual begins. By the way, once again of course accompanied by the lovely music from Eric Murray. You can find a link to that down below in the description. And so, as Redini explains cruelty and death, we obtain ideology development point number 14. And not only that, we also obtain another plus 6 mood bonus for everyone. In the early evening then, it's time to, for the first time in this episode, give out a name, as always chosen from the list of patron supporters in the naming rights tier and above, as we welcome another grizzly bear to Liviana, who from now on will go by the name of Arc Crusade. And just as our second prisoner then regains consciousness, another execution ritual is underway. Yes, because we just performed one, this will likely not be a satisfying experience for those attending, but we are only doing this for the development points anyway. And so, those now rise to 15 as an awkward execution comes to an end, and that means we only need one more point to once again reform our ideology. Now, on the next morning, another bear sees the light of day. This one will now go by the name of Blazors. And with that, our bear army continues to grow. I think we should actually be very close to reaching 20 animals. Unfortunately, though, there is no time to celebrate, as we are interrupted by an attack on the road. Our small caravan has been ambushed, and the attackers demand that we hand over Wyatt. Safe to say that that's not going to happen, so let's begin the fight. We are thankfully only dealing with four pirates here, so a well-timed berserk pulse might be a good idea. Unfortunately though, it only catches one of them, so we'll have to fight the remaining three by conventional means. Interestingly enough then, we receive some unexpected help from our allies. Looks like they have not forgotten the sheer amount of stuff we dumped onto them, and as you can see, they have sent over a small detachment to help us out. And well, with Wyatt already slightly injured, we'll let them do the heavy lifting. Donut can eventually loop around and steal one last kill, but at that point our enemies were already fleeing. And so our caravan continues along the way and just a few moments later finally reaches the relic complex. This somewhat phallic shaped building is where the Redhawk sits and is waiting to be collected. Let's take a peek inside and see what we're dealing with. Right, so for the first time in this series we actually have some mechs here. Disabling their faction does apparently not change the fact that they do protect relics, although for the moment they are inactive. 
However, that will change as soon as we grab the sword, but that is why we brought our Psycaster. Before Light can work his magic though, miracles do happen back home in Liviana. Yes, after numerous attempts it has finally happened, Took and Squigs are finally lovers. So yes indeed, it looks like everything is coming together here in these last few days, and it very much seems like the Cult of Jinx is gearing up for one last big finale. And so let's jump back to Light, who now casts invisibility on himself. Afterwards he can now grab the relic, while Donut and Wyatt already take some precautions. And there we go, a Red Hawk acquired, the Mechanoids now wake up. However, without a target in sight, they have nothing to attack, and they also don't seem to be too eager to leave the building. As a matter of fact, they are also not counted as hostiles that we must defeat in order to reform our caravan, so we could now leave immediately. However, before we do that, we want to take a closer look at what we actually just obtained, because Red Hawk here is a Persona Plasma Sword, and as such it has some traits, specifically Kill Sorrow and Psychic Sensitizer. Now, Kill Sorrow is probably one of the worst traits for a Persona weapon in the game, because whoever eventually ends up wielding this sword will receive a mood penalty every single time the weapon kills someone. So yeah, this definitely makes the sword a bit more interesting. Psychic Sensitizer then is definitely more useful. It increases the wielder's psychic sensitivity by 20%, which is basically the same as the psychic sensitivity personality trait. So that is the Red Hawk, a Persona Plasma Sword that I honestly don't think needs to be sitting on a shrine. So as we send our caravan back home here, the big question now is, who should we give this to? Now I have to admit, as a melee focused character who also has psychic abilities, Wyatt seems like the perfect candidate. He was, after all, specifically recruited for his melee skills, and we did that with the knowledge that this second relic would be a sword. Still, there might be others who you think deserve it more. Whatever your thoughts on the matter, I invite you to leave them down below in the comments. And with that, another evening sets across the cold bog. You can see here the anima tree is almost ready for the next linking ritual again. And so, just in time for the finale, it looks like Wyatt will be able to receive that sixth psycasting rack too. Now at this point, I do have two more things that I'd like to hear about from you guys. The first one is the Destitute Travelers quest that we talked about earlier. As promised, we are going to make the cut before the timer here expires, so let me know in the comments down below whether or not you think we should take this quest in the next episode. The other thing is then more of a small task, an invitation perhaps. As you might remember, at the very beginning of this series, the Cult of Jinx was founded by Specs with this short narrative description. The universe is an endless cycle of creation and destruction. The spirits of trees are mighty, as they bridge the power of the air above with that of the ground beneath and protect those who live below their branches. It is said in the ancient texts that the spirit of the great Jinx, the mightiest spirit of them all, will one day bestow its power upon a chosen one. Now, while I do believe that some of that still describes the Cult of Jinx fairly well, what I would love to see is an update to that, a description that more accurately reflects what the Cult of Jinx has become over the course of 35 episodes. So I invite all of you to create your very own ideology descriptions and leave them in the comments down below. I will then pick one or perhaps even a combination of a few of them and use that in the grand finale as the final narrative, the ultimate description of the Cult of Jinx. And I think on that note, let's make the cut here for today. Like I said, everything is shaping up just right for one wonderful grand finale. And I think, unless Randy has any nasty surprises waiting for us, we'll get to that in the next episode. For today then, I hope you enjoyed this one, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. And if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.